Um. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Microsoft Bill Live. Now, I'm here with Paul and Kiki to talk about React Native. But you guys do way more than React Native. So maybe introduce yourself first and what you do at Microsoft. Uh, yeah, I, my name is Paul Garcimarino, and I work on the user experience platform for Windows, uh, Fluent Design, and now React Native for Windows, too. I'm Kiki St. Ange. I'm a PM. I work with Paul on React Native for Windows and under the app development side. So. Great. So React Native has been around for a few years. React Native for Windows has also been around. But there was a big announcement this morning. Yeah. So maybe you can tell me a bit more. What is React Native, and what was the announcement? Uh, yeah, so R React Native has been you know, around uh, for, for a few years, as you said. And even React Native for Windows uh, started a few years ago kind of more organically in a community-oriented way uh, with people working with uh, Eric Razel just getting, getting it started. And over the last year, we've seen so much more demand for React Native on Windows, both uh, internally as well as externally, that we've worked to get a new generation of React Native for Windows out that we announced is in preview today. We're calling it kind of the V2. And it's based on the new common C++ core uh, with Facebook for React Native across iOS, Android, and Windows. If you know the history of this project, in the past, iOS, Android, and Windows had parallel implementations of React Native. But it was people trying to keep code in sync. And now there's a shared common C++ core that this new generation of React Native for Windows uh, brings with it that is the same as what powers the iOS and Android versions, too. Right. So I can build uh, Windows apps today with JavaScript. Right? I can do progressive web applications. How yeah. is this different than just progressive web apps, for example? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, if you want to use web technologies in JavaScript and TypeScript today to reach Windows, you can make web apps or PWAs. Those run in the sandbox of the browser, and they can do only what HTML in the browser let you do. So if you want to access files or just other things in the system, unless those are added to the browser API set and PWA and so forth, you can't do those things. Some developers try to use Electron, which lets you do those things. But Electron still limits you to only use HTML for your UI, and it also only works on desktop. React Native works across desktop and mobile, and it lets you use 100% of the APIs of the native platform, including all the UI APIs, interacting with native UI components, even uh, UI that you built previously natively. So you have unfettered access to the full platform. Right. So React Native applications, there are native applications. right? When I build JavaScript and HTML, they render as native applications. Now, are there any performance considerations when I'm using React Native? Um, you know, in general, you know, we have a much lower uh, kind of baseline reference set than something like Re uh, Electron or PWA. So you start with much lower memory usage already. So you should have better performance because it's all native. And all the UI controls themselves are fully natively implemented in C++ and so forth. So they're all high performance. So like anything else, you'd want to follow best practices and so forth to you know, have good performance with your app. But um, it starts at a much lower baseline than a lot of other options. So what about the business logic? How does the business logic work in React Native applications? Is that still JavaScript? 100%. 100%. All of the business logic that you've written in JavaScript can be translated over into React Native. And even if you've developed it not in React. So React Native is an extension of React or React.js, which is a way you can develop for the web. And if you've written JavaScript for that, it translates one to one. If you've written JavaScript for the web in general, it almost translates one to one directly over. So Anywhere where you've come from JavaScript development for the web, you can write for React Native. Right. And then when I build my HTML controls in React, they render as native controls. How's the, how does that work behind the scenes? Oh, you said HTML. You... Right. When I write my React applications, how does that work behind the scenes in the architecture? They world? call directly the web components. So right. HTML translates when whatever Chrome or Edge or whatever browser you're using will use that. Right. corresponding web components. That's, that's awesome. So does it only work with UWP applications, or can I use this with, let's say, WPF or WinForms? Absolutely. So with UWP, that's where our V2 React Native stuff is, is working, and it runs 100% on their new native Windows platform. But we also, if you're familiar with XAML Islands, which is right. something we introduced last year at Build, is a way to host all the Win10 goodness in WPF uh, and when forms. And through XAML Islands, you can host React Native. And you'll get Win 10 richness directly inside your Win32 app. Right. So I can build my UI once in React Native. Mm -hmm. And I can not do it only in UWP. With XAML Islands, now I can also do it in any Win32 applications. And I can also take that code into my mobile applications and render it for iOS and Android. So it's truly a more universal 
platform. Yeah, absolutely. Now, for somebody that wants to get started, um, why would I choose React Native to get started over other technologies? Um, so, you know, there's a set of ways people approach cross-platform development centers. They make native apps for each platform. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, another great solution is Xamarin and Xamarin Forms that, you know, Microsoft supports, and that's great for .NET developers, people want to use that ecosystem, and, and C Sharp and those languages. Uh, React Native is great for people who are coming from more of a JavaScript, TypeScript, web ecosystem, and want to use uh, those libraries and, and languages and, and so forth. And so that's, you know, those are other solutions, depending on kind of where you're coming from and the ecosystem and languages you want to use to reach cross-platform as well as native um, platform development. Now, if I'm already a React development, I've already built React applications, how much of my code can I actually reuse across React Native? Uh, all of it. So all of the JavaScript business logic is exactly the same in React to React. Even the UI uh, portion of it? The minor differences are the way that the UI is laid out. So React Native has a mildly different way that it structures how you set up your layout and your props. It actually has a styling very similar to CSS, and that's almost a one-to-one -one translation. But the actual tags of how you lay out your styling is very mildly different. So instead of a div tag, you might have a view. And instead of an input type being a checkbox, you'll just have a checkbox. And if you're familiar with UWP XAML app development, it's actually very similar to that method of programming than it is to HTML. So if you're a XAML developer, definitely React Native is a more friendly translation for you. If you're a React developer, all of your JavaScript comes along, and you just have to learn mild translations between using web components versus interopping directly with native components. Right. Are there any applications that you know that are already using React Native on Windows? Um, yeah, so there's um, uh, uh, several partners, and we'll talk a little bit about them in our, in our talk tomorrow. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of apps already, since this has been a very organic community thing, how it started, that, that shipped to the store and are very successful today with React Native for Windows. And there's a number of internal partners, including Microsoft Office, who are working with us on this next generation of React Native for Windows with the intent to use that. There was a story recently uh, that one of these companies that does these app statistics um, published uh, about Microsoft having, I think, 38 apps uh, that are now published to various app stores that use React Native. And so it's definitely something that we're seeing you know, a reasonable amount of usage within Microsoft for. And that's one of the reasons for our doing a better job really supporting it as a first class way of targeting Windows, too. So React Native on, for Windows is actually used by first party applications inside of Microsoft. And you mentioned Office is actually using it. What are they using it for? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll show this a little bit in our talk. But they're, they're actually, you know, it's an open source project. So developers from Office are actually participating in the actual creation of React Native for, for Windows and, and with us uh, with the intent to use it in uh, a number of Office scenarios. So like one I'm going to show tomorrow is commenting uh, in Word. Um, but there'll, there'll be others that I'll let those product teams disclose their product plans. <laughs> so one of the big things about developing with JavaScript is that the code is very easily updatable. And I heard there's a way to actually do that through Visual Studio App Center. How does that work? Yes, Visual yeah. Studio App Center is a service that we provide. Mm -hmm. And it has many different features to it. Data analytics of your app. You can track events. You can manage all the sessions. You can track crashes and bug reports and stuff like that. And one of the features that it has, which is super awesome for app development, is a service called Code Push, which allows you to quickly roll out and push out feature updates or changes or minor bug fixes to your app without having to go through the complexity of the Apple App Store or the Google right. Play Store or whatever that is, where you have to go and download and restart your app. It's just next time you launch, you Code Pushed it, and your user gets those updates and those changes instantly. Right, so I've published my application to the store, and the next day is like, oh, I made a mistake. I need to actually fix something. I don't have to go through the certification process again to update my application. I just push it through yes. App Center, and the next time the user launches the app, it actually lies. And the user's app has no knowledge of the App Center. It's something you completely right. set up on the dev end. So they just automatically get changes, and oh, my app's working better. <laughs> it, it's great, because it lets you bring together a lot of the benefits of the web development with a lot of benefits of native development, and have a more web-like app cycle as well, mm -hmm. using things like App Center. Right. Um, is there a way to mix React Native uh, application and React Native controls with other types of controls, like XAML, for example, or other types of uh, frameworks? Yeah, absolutely. You can, uh, the way that we're structured, and I'll go into a lot more depth tomorrow in our, in our talk then, but the way that we structure, or all React Native apps are structured, is that when you create your project, you get the equivalent on other 
platforms of a Visual Studio solution. So inside that, on the Windows end, you can go in and you can write as many native controls as you want. You can surface them up, or you could have React Native be a component in your own right. Windows app. And yeah. Yeah, we, have we call it the inside out and the outside in model. Yeah. So you can either wrap native components to use them from within React Native, or you can take React Native itself and use it inside the context of a XAML right. UI on, on Windows. So you can kind of, it's very flexible in how it interops. So if I just have a component that I want to share across all of my applications, or even teams that are working on different applications, yeah. I could do that in React Native. Yeah, because we know the modern development world for our customers is one where they have lots of different teams working, lots of different components, and there's different technologies they have to put together to make their applications. And so interoperability is really key, and this really lets you do that, where you could have some component that maybe you either already have, or for whatever reason you want to really write natively to fully exploit the native platform, and you can continue investing in that code, continue moving forward your native code, uh, while maybe you have some other aspect that you want to just write and share the, more of the UI code of with React Native, and you can do that as well, and kind of put them together very seamlessly with, with relatively low overhead. That's really been a lot of the V2 focus is having very minimal overhead there. Yeah. Right. And then you mentioned you can also access native APIs, like file system, Bluetooth, et cetera. How does that work? Like, how do you do that through JavaScript? So a lot of the stuff you get for free already. So React Native has a core set. It has a core set of components, which are like controls, as you would see, like calendar view or text input or whatever. And then they have a core set of what they call modules, which are APIs. And those interface with the respective APIs or non-visual aspects of each platform, iOS, Android, or Windows. So a lot of that stuff is already built in for free. So you call the right thing. You look at their documentation. You call the right thing, and everything's all set. Some things, like file I.O., uh, you may need to write a little bit yourself. So you would hook it up on iOS. You'd hook it up on Android. You'd call the respective methods that you'd need on each platform. And then you'd write one line of JavaScript that, when it ran on those respective devices, would call that certain I.O. So for some things, it's automatically set up. For other things, you might have to surface it up right. into the React Native layer. But all of that's available so to you. So sort of like extensions that you can put into React Native. Is there a set of community extensions that you can use or contribute yes. to right now? Yeah. Oh, there's a whole host of amazing community, uh, both modules and components out there that you can use. And another thing that we'll be showing in our presentation tomorrow is how you can grab those and use them and uh, how they're all available to you. And they have all community support. It's pretty awesome. And this is, sounds amazing. Like, it sounds really easy. How do you actually get started with React Native? Let's say I want to start with an existing React application. How do I move it to React Native? Uh, you can join us today, immediately, right after this, by going to our GitHub page. It's under the Microsoft organization. It's react-native-windows. And that's where we're doing everything. It's all out in the open. There's a huge effort across Microsoft, as you may know, to be completely open source with as many things as we can manage. And we are no exception to that. So you can go on our GitHub. You can check out all of our issues, our milestones, projects. You can go ahead and give us your feedback on what, you're, what you'd like to see right. from us. You can start right away, make PRs if you want to, like anything. So if somebody wants to add a feature to React Native or Windows, they can do that. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, it's the new Microsoft. <laughs> awesome. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for taking the time to spend with us. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this session. We're going to be here all, all, the, all day as long as the build conference is going on. So make sure you stick around. Thank you. Thanks.